Dr. Katz and all in the shed tonight. And Sharon and Larry, if you would come out and help us do that. Sharon and Dr. Larry Smart. Thank you. It's been great to have him back. I love having Mark here. So he already did all my job, but just in case uh, you might have missed something, I didn't do as much. <laughs> We did have a great time last night at my house talking with Larry about all the things. And when these two guys to get, to get together, the world changes. Um, I'm Sharon Anderson Morris. How many of you have been here before? Like almost half. Thanks for coming back. Um, so this is the third in our series. So exciting. On behalf of Strategic News Service, I'm honored to tell you that we're trying to find the best speakers in the world that we're connected to to address global challenges. And when I was thinking about healthcare, we really should talk about healthcare. And who knows better about healthcare in our group of technology leaders? And it's Dr. Larry Smart. He's a family friend of ours. He's on a fire advisory board. He's um, he's been with us, and every time we make another decision about something, whether it's about healthcare and talking about the future of that, you know, he, he's he's involved with global warming. So if you have the chance to meet with him, ask him about his thoughts about global warming and and carry it on. He, he's one of those guys that knows everything about everything. But tonight, <laughs> but tonight, and tonight we're going to talk about healthcare. So. Um, you probably all know I'm the Program Director for Strategic New Service for Future and Review, and I'm the uh, Managing Director of Fire Films. Um, Larry uh, is actually walking genetic observatory, and it's very interesting here. He looks so normal and common, <laughs> and he's really not, and you'll see why. I'm going to have to tell you a little bit of the background here, and I have to read this because he's really a scientist, and I'm not. Um, he was the founding director of the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology, Cal IT2. I don't know if many of you have heard of that. It's UC San Diego and Irvine Partnership. He holds the Harry E. Gruber professor Professorship in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. He was the founding director of the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, NCSA, at Champaign-Urbana, U of I. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, as well as a fellow of the American Physical Society of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. For eight years, he was a member of the National Institute of Health, advisory committee to the NIH director, serving three directors. And he always wanted me to tell something really personal about him, um, which is Larry is passionate about growing orchids. He snorkels the coral reefs, and he is passionate about quantifying the state of his body. So please welcome Larry Smart. Today we were at the outreach center with the students, and I think Terry told you, um, it, you know, there's a bunch of kids kind of like anxious, the kicking the chairs, and kind of moving around, and then Larry started talking about things that they related to, and, the, and it was quiet, and the questions came one after another, after another, after another, but what should I eat, what shouldn't I eat, why is that bad for me, and how can I get good food? And, and Larry filled the hour within no time with questions from our students here who really care about being healthy and it was really moving today. So thank you for doing this for that today. So let's start off with talking about the history. How do you how have you seen exponential change in technology over the last few decades that disrupts pre-existing industries like tech, like healthcare? Well, we're living through <clears throat> one of the most amazing periods in human history in the last several million years. And that we have these sustained exponential changes. Exponentials like Moore's Law. Every 10 years, your computers are a thousand times faster or for the same speed, a thousand times cheaper. And it happens decade after decade after decade. There's never been a period and that has happened before. And, and so what used to take maybe 50 or 60 years to disrupt an industry from some new technology is now taking place in less than a decade. I mean, look back, it was uh, only 20 years ago that the web browser first appeared. It came out of my lab at NCSA with Mosaic, uh, Mark Andreessen, uh, and Eric Bina, undergraduate, graduate student, era. You know, Mark went off to form Netscape, uh, Microsoft licensed it, uh, form Internet Explorer, and so forth. Now, in 1994, exactly 20 years ago, I was at a conference like this uh, full of uh, C-level executives, uh, CEOs, CIOs, CTOs of some of America's biggest corporations. And I showed them on a dial-up modem, internet, that's all we had back then, <laughs> the first time they'd ever seen the web. And 
you know, there were maybe a hundred websites in the world then. There are hundreds of millions now in just 20 years. And I took them to a few of these sites, like the Honolulu Dinosaur Museum and uh, the picture of the camera on the coffee pot at Cambridge University so you wouldn't have to walk down the hall to see if there was coffee. And, <laughs> and so, and so these, these, these CEOs came up to me afterwards and I said, you pointy-handed academics, we can guarantee you there's no business use of this web of yours. <laughs> okay, now let's fast forward uh, only seven years from the birth of the web uh, to 2001. Remember what happened in 2001? iTunes, iPod, and a genius, Steve Jobs, said, you know, Everybody seems to think that the way you get music is you have to go to places like Tower Records stores and have these consumer totally unfriendly packages with CDs. Remember how all the tape and everything you had? How, how, many, how many of you were really frustrated with trying to get to music that way? But in that seven years, the World Wide Web had gone from nothing to the whole world. And Steve understood that he could completely disrupt the record industry uh, by uh, offering off digital music on iTunes and invented the iPod and, of course, later uh, the iPad and iPhone. <coughs> the guys, you know, in the record stores just said, oh, what is this, you know? Was it two years or three years later that they were all bankrupt? That's digital disruption. And then, that was 2001. Three years later, this misanthrope student at Harvard, Mark Zuckerberg, got pissed off at his girlfriend and went and got the pictures from all the, how many of you have seen the social network, the movie, right? Puts up this thing called the Facebook. It's only 10 years ago that that happened in his Harvard dorm room. There wasn't any social media. There are now 1.3 billion users of Facebook worldwide. It's the most used thing on the web. And Mark's personal fortune went up in one day by two to three billion dollars just a few weeks ago in one move of Facebook stock. This is the speed of digital disruption. And it is just, I don't think people understand how much can change in a decade. So I just want to give you a little reflection on just two decades and one decade ago and how our world is nothing like what it was. So what are you seeing in early stages of digital, digital disruption right now in healthcare? Well, you know, the, what is the one thing they tell you about your medical records? Whatever you do, give people your social security number, but don't let them see your medical records. Something horrible will happen to you. Now, it's true that we don't have the right laws yet in the country to protect you, but it's your data. And what you're seeing is that patients like me and 23andMe and a lot of these sites, people are realizing that now that we have social networks, I can share my numbers with people who have the same problem I've got. And they're more likely to get a helpful information from people who are using the same drugs, having the, sad, 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 the side effects, than they're ever going to get from the 10 or 20 minutes, maybe an hour, a year they get from their doctor. And so they're engaged in massive civil disobedience. They're sharing their medical data. <laughs> so that's an early indicator that the digital technologies, the, the digital frameworks like sharing networks enable we, the normal citizens, to do things that we could never do before. How would you find the people in the world that have your particular ailment? They're taking your particular drug. How would you ever find them? It takes you about five seconds nowadays on the web. So that is why I don't believe the current medical establishment will survive in its current form more than you know another five or ten. So this is where it gets really interesting. 
So leave the rest of us. You've turned your body into a digital lab, let's say. Can you share with us your journey and tell us what that means? Sure. I don't have the slides. <clears throat> so we're going to engage in a little transparency here. Um, <clears throat> this is me uh, at Illinois. I was uh, running the supercomputer center until 2000 when I came out to La Jolla. And uh, uh, here I am at 41 years old. I look about the same as I did when I was 18 then. Um, you know, good health and so forth. How many of you are under 40? Well, <laughs> something terrible happened to me. Oh, it's called the 40s. <laughs> and I'm sharing with you because actually this is from an interview that I gave, and it's on the web for those of you who really want to you know, humiliate me. But um, I leave it up because I don't want to go back there. This is Illinois. This was where the obesity epidemic began 30 or more years ago. And um, I was an average American, except in this picture, thinner than the average American, two-thirds of whom are overweight or obese now. That wouldn't be so bad, except that that leads directly to diabetes, heart disease, cancer, strokes. And, and our country is getting sicker and sicker and sicker. So I got to La Jolla and I looked around, all these people are on bicycles and they're running and they're thin and they're energetic and they're moving and, and, and you know, this is one year later. I looked around and said, huh, <laughs> they're going to send me back if I don't get with the program. And so here I am 10 years older. I'm now actually 65. And I completely turned my body around by taking personal responsibility for it and learning what is the nature of your body in terms of its biochemistry, in terms of your glucose and insulin uh, cycles, and why you shouldn't eat sugar and you shouldn't be spiking your glucose uh, system all the time, uh, difference between omega-3 and omega-6 uh, acid, uh, fatty acids in terms of, of uh, driving inflammation in your body and so forth. But what I realized is the only way to get the feedback I needed to change my body was to digify, digitize essentially everything. In other words, it isn't what you eat in terms of you know asparagus versus a steak or something. It's what are how many calories, what are the proteins, what are the carbs, what are the fats, how much sugar, how much fiber, how much water a day. And so I started taking that and actually digitizing it. And now, for instance, I use a uh, app on your smartphone called MyFitnessPal. There are 40 million users of that now. So I wanted to find out how well I was doing. Was I really reducing the inflammation in my body by changing my food? And so I, there's a blood <coughs> test you can do. I couldn't get any doctor to give me this blood test. And so, um, I realized there was a place online you could get a kit, and then you go down to a place and you know give your arm and they take your blood. About a quarter of all blood tests are outside of hospitals in America. Did you know that? Breast diagnostics, places like that. Well, before long, I was measuring 150 things in my blood, and uh, Stu, I'm a little obsessive, I <laughs> and, but it was science, right? And I was fascinated. Wow, you can figure this stuff out. You can actually track all these different things. Your liver enzymes, your how your kidneys are doing, your cholesterol, you know, all of the electrolytes in your body and so forth. So these are actually graphs over 10 years of all of these things on one of my big walls that has about 64 times as many pixels as your PC. Um, the rule in my center is I get the new toys first. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, I looked at my liver, it was, it was great, my kidneys, everything. But amazingly enough, there was this one item, which was in my blood, it's called um, CRP, complex reactive protein, and it's just a generic measure of inflammation. Well, it's supposed to be lower than the green line. But instead, I was up here at five, back in 2005, 
and then 10, and then 15. And at this point, I was taking this graph into my doctor and said, something terrible is going on inside of me because my food, which is what makes most Americans inflamed uh, 10 times what they ought to be, uh, I'm not eating that food, and so I shouldn't be inflamed. And I am, but it's growing. There must be something inside me that's, you know, doing this. And, and they said, uh-huh, how, how do you feel? <laughs> I said, fine. And they said, well, what are your symptoms? I said, I don't have symptoms, I have data. <laughs> and they said, well, why are you showing me that? I'm a doctor. That's not useful. So come back when you have a symptom. Well, I was at a place like this, and sure enough, within like, you know, a, a, a week or two of the spike, I got an incredibly sharp pain here, and, and doubled over, couldn't sleep, could barely drag myself back to the hospital, and they said, hmm, you seem to have a diverticulitis attack. Uh, you know, here, I'll give you some antibiotics for a few days, and you'll be fine. And, you know, sure enough, my, uh, uh, my thing fell, my value fell, but that fell to five, not under one. And then it kept going up, and before long, it was almost 30 times normal. And so, uh, long story short, I started doing some stool samples, which, because your colon is your largest, your large intestine is your largest immune organ, it actually will tell you information that you don't see in your bloodstream. And it turned out I had uh, a particular protein called lactoferrin that was 125 times the upper limit for health, 125 times. And when you look that up, you find out that you have, the only thing that can drive you like that is having an autoimmune disease called inflammatory bowel disease, and in particular, Crohn's disease, which I had no idea I had. And my doctor actually said he didn't believe that I had it. So we got a new doctor. <laughs> I, I go through a lot of doctors. <laughs> uh, and he said, well, let's get, let's do, let's see if we can confirm this. Let's do an MRI. And you can see in the normal slices that they do when I went in the MRI, I drank three bottles of barium sulfate to give contrast to my colon. And when I'm in there, they inject me with contrast so my veins are, and arteries are contrast. But I said, at the, as soon as I got out, what did I tell them? What did I say? Give me the data. Right? You always want to get your data. It's your body that generated it. It's your data. Okay, so, but of course, I took it back to our virtual reality team, gave it to them. They put it in our software and created a 3D fly through video game of my insights, <laughs> <laughs> which is one of the big attractions at my institute now. I take you in a virtual reality cave and fly through me. <laughs> uh, but in particular, uh, right about here, uh, there was this. Uh, this is your descending colon, and then it was funny pink, and then this part looked odd, which you can see over here, right? And it's about six inches. I can then digitally just take that 3D thing out, and you can see as a half of people my age, I have diverticula, sort of won't be, it's not like a smooth thing, like a sausage looking thing. Um, and I can even cross section it, and you can see how uh, inflamed, how thick the walls are. They're supposed to be as thin as a balloon like three millimeters, that's 15 millimeters thick from the inflammation that's there. But then I said, okay, wow, it's just six inches here, because everything else did colonoscopy was fine except for this six inches. And I said, well, it's a 3D thing. Don't we have one of those 3D printers? I can't you just print my colon? And sure enough, <laughs> here, here is exactly you know, this part, the business part right here that had the inflammation. And uh, this is descending, and here's this funny kink, right? And try to imagine this stuff trying to get through, or try to imagine the hose going the other way, the philosophy. And this is the inflamed part, right? <laughs> you want to hold my phone? <laughs> Pass around. <laughs> so, but then I said, okay. Why is my immune system going crazy in my colon? Well, what's in my colon? Now, we're going to get a little 
technical here. We're going to have to talk about school. <laughs> because here's the deal. Half of the weight of school is bacteria. 90% of the cells in your body are not human. They're the bacteria that live in your colon, on your skin, and everything else. Now, I have been an astrophysicist for 25 years. I've worked with Stephen Hawking. I've done a lot of stuff with black holes. I've done observations of galaxies, like this is our sister galaxy, Andromeda. And I thought this was pretty complicated stuff. There's 100 billion stars in one galaxy. 100 billion stars. But there's a thousand times that many bacteria in each one of you. A hundred trillion. And they're engaged in this activity with the immune system. And so I figured, well, the only way I'm going to know what is going on with me, if I can figure out what are those microbes, and the only way you can do that is genetically sequence them. Now, fortunately, you've all heard of the Human Genome Program that Nobel Prize was given for. Craig Venter was, you know, one of the main people driving that. That cost about $4 billion. You might have heard two weeks ago that one of the companies coming from La Jolla, Illumina, now can do it for a thousand, a million times cheaper in just 15 years. So I went to the Craig Venter Institute. I gave them a sample of my stool to sequence. Then I use supercomputers. And what you see here is uh, uh, the 200. Each, each of these is a bar. Each of those is a species of bacteria. There's hundreds of species inside of it. And I can actually get the relative abundance across these. And I can compare them between healthy people. I can compare them over me with time. Uh, and what I found is very simple. In the uh, healthy person, but you don't need to know the names. These are the big groupings of bacteria. But let's call it blue and red. And that's most of what a healthy is. Well, here's someone that has Crohn's or ulcerative colitis in two forms of autoimmune disease, inflammatory bowel disease. You'll notice, let's just see where the happened to the blue. It's totally wiped out. And what happened to the purple, which is E. coli? It's totally, it's, it's, it's actually a henobacteria. These are like bifids. And over here, the green, which is E. coli, is exploded. Right? So you have not a small change. You have a massive disruption of the ecology that's within you. You are an ecology vastly more complicated than any fancy garden you've ever been in. Right? And keeping those, almost all those bugs do good things for you. But now they're completely wiped out, and their inner immune system is interacting with it. And that's what causes the disease state. Now, the trouble is, all of this is outside of modern medicine. None of modern medicine is including the state of your microbiome, because until a few years ago, we didn't know what it was, because we didn't have the genome sequencing cheap enough that we can do it. How many of you know what your microbiome is? That would be, who say? OK. <laughs> well, in the next five or 10 years, you're all going to know. It's one of the biggest changes in the history of medicine, and it's just about to happen. And so uh, what about me? Well, you can see I'm sort of like this guy, purple, red, not much blue. But I'm sort of like this guy. So in fact, there's like, there is an autism and other things, a spectrum, not just this and that, but a whole spectrum. And I think we don't talk that way yet about these autoimmune diseases. We will. And so that's an example of what happens when you really use the modern tools that are available to quantify your body and learn the basic variables of what's going on inside of you and not just this epiphenomena of symptoms. And that's, I think, where we're going with medicine. Just, there's an extra scroll over. Somebody have this scroll over? Oh, just, just make sure I get back. Keep going. Oh, yeah, they love it. They said, we have a 3D printer in the school. Yeah. Or you all, they'll be making their own colons. <laughs> <laughs> we hope that that's all that they'll be making. <laughs> Larry, looking at 10 years from now, what do you see would be disruptive technologies in healthcare? Well, look, this sounds like a crazy person talking, right? What you just heard. 
It's called an n equal one experiment, where you have one person who's done their body in extreme detail over time series. Okay, Michael Snyder, who's the chair of uh, genetics at Stanford, is the other person in the country besides me who's mostly talked about doing this. But what's this year about? Did you hear this week, Eric, that uh, Craig Venter? It started a new company. He's going to sequence 40,000 people a year starting this year. You know, we'll be sequencing a million of our citizens a year in just a couple of years. Now, that's an interesting number. How many babies do you think are born a year in America? Four million. So and by well before 2020, we will be have the capability as just instead of remember, you know, getting the footprint, you know, that's a good piece of information to have. <laughs> but wouldn't it be good to actually have the basic software of what makes you a person uh, when you're born as well? And and so that's where we're going. That it will be completely routine to have all of this information that tells us who we are and the vast ecology that we have that changes every time you eat something. Your microbes change. The distribution changes. And, and so there are startups like Ubio that was crowdfunded by people like you that's now making a little thing with just a little Q-tip. You put in a little vial after you take your toilet paper, strip it like that, put it in a little vial, put it in the US mail, and it comes back. I just heard somebody today say, wow, I'm 54% I'm 54% Firmicutes and 44% Bacteriotes on Twitter. <laughs> I'm so happy. You know, he said, I'm so happy because I now know who we are, meaning his superorganism body. This is going to be radically disruptive. And here's another thing. You know, any of you, I mean, you see your doctor how much a year? 15 minutes? Half an hour? Anybody got an hour? <laughs> well, yeah, okay. One person in the audience had more than an hour. He's married to a who's, who is, who is <laughs> Whose responsibility is it to keep you healthy? There are about 9,000 hours in the year. So about 8,999 of, 99 of those are your responsibility, and one of them is the doctor. That's the reality of the world we live in. And so each of us are going to have to take this kind of responsibility. Now, you would say, well, what do I know about this? Well, what did you, you know, until, <laughs> I mean, who had apps a few years ago on their smartphone? They're now a billion of these. So there is going to be more and more. How many people saw her, the movie? Okay? Artificial intelligence is coming. Watson, right? Remember Watson beat Jeopardy? Okay, that's a billion dollars IBM is putting into the Watson program. It's going to be in your phone. So you're going to have abilities to take these numbers. Who has Fitbits? Who has Nike fuel bands? Who's measuring their steps when they're up here? Okay? It's exploded. All that information is hitting your phone, right? So when I when I exercise on my elliptical, I put a polar chest band on and it comes to my phone. I actually see my heart rate graphing itself as I go in my intervals and so forth. So we are going to have, essentially, each of us are going to have individual assistants to help us through that almost 9,000 to 1 times that we're on our own. That never happened in history before. And so I think that's where we're going. And so you're the informed patient. You're unusual because you have access to all these labs where you can send all of your different various samples off to, and you get those back. And you know probably more than your doctor does. And you go into your doctor and you say, Way more. Way more. And you go into your doctor, he's probably scared of it. I don't have doctors working right here. No. <laughs> but instead of you're letting your disease take, care, take control of you, you actually are monitoring your own body, which is, I think, where we all would like to go. So know what's happening inside. So we've looked at the future, we talked about the past of healthcare, and if we bring this down to a personal level for us here, um, what do you think we should do personally? Are there things that we should monitor, or there's thing, are there things that you've suggested we do to make sure right. that we're healthy? Yeah, well, I mean, there's basically four pillars of health, 
that will keep you healthy your whole life. One is uh, nutrition, one is exercise. One of the ones, the most neglected one, is sleep. That's so important and it's so abused. Um, and you pay for it. And the other is stress reduction. Those four things, if you eat real food, if you increase the amount that you move your body, if you really try to get eight hours of sleep a night, and if you reduce unnecessary stress in your life, you're very much, you've just increased by 90% your chances of staying healthy for most of your life. So how do you measure those? Well, again, real food. That's not what we're marketed. That's not what we're surrounded by. That's not what we're told to eat. But there is a very much a growing effort. And here in Park City, you're one of the more healthy islands in the country. You know, everybody's coming here to exercise. You know, you, there's, there's a real fast growth of organic, locally grown food, of, of grass-fed meat if you're a meat eater, uh, of uh, low glycemic carbohydrates. I mean, there's a reason people get fat. You know, it's a reason there's this epidemic going on. In 1970, the average American consumed one pound a year of high fructose corn syrup. How much do you think it is now? 50 pounds a year. Coke is liquid corn in the United States. In other countries, they use sugar. In the United States, it's high fructose corn syrup. It's been that way since the 80s. Ah, the same degree as the obesity epidemic. So, you know, there, there's a correlation. Because high fructose corn syrup was driven to be cheaper than sugar by the government subsidies for the corn industry, undercutting the price of the previous one or 200 year government agribusiness cartel, which was sugar. We used to go, we, we, we overthrew countries all over the place for sugar, right? But the subsidies, I mean, you know, here we are having this discussion about renewable energy, and, and Obama's trying to say, you know, should we really be giving the oil companies subsidies? Well, I'm not hearing, given that the farm bill, just the multi-billion farm bill just went through with unanimous bipartisan, with bipartisan support, why are we substituting, why are we giving subsidies to food that is killing us as a country, that is making us sick? And well, we are. So I think that that's a real part. The Fitbit thing, all of the idea that once, you know, typically the average Fitbit user starts running 43 or walking 43% more just by knowing the number. When you see how little you're moving, you just are voluntarily. And then you get groups starting to work together, right? I mean, I actually, to measure sleep, I wore a Zio, which is a, a little thing here with a headband that measures your brain waves and your your uh, muscles when you're, I, I did it 700 nights. And every 30 seconds, it tells me whether I'm in deep sleep, light sleep, REM, uh, dream sleep, or awake, and graphs it, right? I learned things about myself. I mean, what do you know about yourself for a third of your life? <laughs> like, where did that go? Does it ever, does it ever think, do you ever think about that? I know nothing about one third of my life. I got amnesia. <laughs> but with these devices, including things like Fitbits and Nike Pro Dance and so forth, you can begin to actually see what goes on when you sleep and how to optimize it, how to change, you know, stop drinking caffeine just before you go to bed if you really want to sleep. Your body does all of its garbage collection in your brain during the night. There's a reason we sleep. Okay? But if you think you don't need to sleep, well, fine. You'll pay. Because if you look at shift workers, their health is totally disrupted because their circadian rhythm has changed. So the point is, before you didn't have you had an excuse, you couldn't measure it. You don't have that excuse anymore. And so I think that's what's changing. And it's a, gonna be, you know, it took us 30 years or 40 years to get to the peak of the obesity epidemic. It's gonna take us probably a similar amount of time to come down from it. But maybe it'll take less time because we have the digital framework that they didn't have during that time. And we have the personal individualized feedback that never existed in the history of humankind. 
So we'll open this up for Q&A. Um, and I asked Larry, maybe I'm just me, but I, I said, okay, so easy to say, lessen your stress and get more sleep. Okay, right, right, okay. How do you do that? Okay, Larry, how do you do that? And, and Larry said, there's a few things about sleeping and there's a few things about stress. And we have a couple of yoga instructors here, don't we? Yeah, there we go. And Larry talked about breathing techniques for reducing stress. Meditation, there's, you know, there's just really, you're an animal. You have this circadian thing in your head that notices whether it's day or night. If you're watching TV with bright blue characteristics in the light until you go to bed, you're completely messing up your circadian rhythm. You want to have, the reason it, you know, it gets red, you know sunsets, red, orange, right? You notice that? That's telling the brain it's coming to be nighttime. And so if you fill your house at night with, with blue light, basically, like comes from TVs, um, it's going to be hard to go to sleep. If you drink caffeine, what's caffeine do? It's to keep you awake. I don't drink any caffeine after 10 in the morning. Okay? Don't work right up until you go to sleep. Your brain is really active. The whole point of sleep is to get your brain unactive so they can take the garbage out. That's why they, 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 they tear up the streets at night and then put them back together in the morning. Right? And this is common sense. But uh, these things make huge differences and people are beginning to recognize that they can't just say, the doctor will fix me. Right? Once I'm broken. What we want to do is to stay healthy as much as we can our whole lives. So let's open it up for Q&A. Sure. Go ahead, and we're going to pass the mic around because it just makes it easier. And I can't see you anywhere, yeah, so. Yeah. Right. Right. Lights. <laughs> you talked about the, I'm, my name is David Lawrence, um, part of the group. Uh, you talked about sugar being such a, a, a bad thing for the body. How about gluten products and gluten-free products? So how many of you are, are avoiding gluten these days? Wow. Yeah. It's a, one of the fastest growing trends. I don't have time to go into the whole detail, but over the last 50 to 100,000 years of evolution of humans from coming out of Africa, those who were in river valleys where agriculture was developed and domesticated animals were developed, over generations, 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 gradually evolved the capability of digesting lactose that is milk products, and gluten. But many of the world weren't in those river valleys and never developed that. So for instance, African Americans are about 85% lactose intolerant. Because when they brought the slaves over from Sub-Saharan Africa, they hadn't been through river valleys. They didn't have uh, lactase as a, as a, a, a gene to make that protein. Um, and so we're a real mix of people who, who sort of adapted and didn't adapt. So while some will be extreme and have celiac, and if you act, you know, eat one crouton, you're in the hospital. <coughs> but that's only about a percent of the population or less. Um, but many of you, because of who your ancestors were and whose DNA you became you, you will have, depending on your ancestry, more or less of an intolerance for things like lactose or uh, gluten or soy or corn. There's about six of these that are that are that are tied to our evolution as humans, uh, and yet we're in a culture that wants to give everybody the same food because that maximizes the profit for the food producer. And what we're trying to get to is a much more individualized. Uh, diet where you eat the food that's right for your body and until you had these tools it was hard to figure that out but you'll have your genome you'll know what your microbes are you'll be able to, to, to tell from the food you're eating what things are. so this is why uh, I think you're seeing uh, uh, gluten-free be one of the fastest growing things people come up to me all the time no more migraines their abdominal pains are gone my particular, my, my leg was swollen twice this big, and I stopped eating gluten and went away and it's never come back. So there, these are anecdotes, it's not science, but there are a lot more studies that are being done, and you're gonna see this come out. But the trouble is, it's not gonna say everybody shouldn't eat this. It's gonna say, if you have these genetic characteristics, you shouldn't be eating them. 
Um, we also don't we have a gluten-free flour company here? Well, in yeah, Weedo, right here in Park City. Anybody know about Weedo, the banana? Uh, give me, this is, I'm, I'm so blessed. What am I taking home as an honorarium for this? Two containers of Weedo banana flour, gluten-free. I'm so excited. Because we don't pay enough. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, my wife and I have, I've only been doing this about two years, but my wife and I have been experimenting with how you cook in a world without gluten. It ain't easy, but you end up with about 15 different kinds of flour. So there's nut flours, there's bean flours, there's all the grains that aren't uh, wheat, uh, amaranth, and, and, and quinoa, and millet, uh, sorghum, and so forth. And then they all have different chemical and physical properties. So it's not simple. But uh, I was just at, uh, what was that wonderful uh, Good Karma restaurant? Good Karma for dinner. Oh my God. That is one of the best restaurants for paying attention to gluten free and vegetarian and vegan I've ever been in. And the food was stunningly delicious. So it's just, this is where we're going to have innovation, entrepreneurs. It's, it's a wide open market. And, and you're just going to see an explosion of this and individualized food. Let's take another question. Are ease of this, Sharon? Let's, anybody on this side first that has a question, and then we'll pass the mic. Yeah, let's just go that way. Thanks. Hi. Um, it's great to see innovators like yourself and um, institutions like FIRE doing that kind of innovation. But, but I just want to have your comment on something I call the closing of the scientific mind. I, I cured my son of fulminant ulcerative colitis using probiotics I literally had to smuggle from Germany in 2009. E. coli in a seal, 1917. Yes, 1917, yes. You still have I wish I could get it. You still have to smuggle it in from Canada. I'm too um, visible to right. use it. Um, the FDA doesn't allow it in this country. Right, now, there's, there's another thing called, it's kind of gross, fecal transplant therapy yeah. that the FDA outlawed. There was a doctor in Texas doing this. It's no longer allowed in the United States. Well, it's come back. They, they oh. changed their mind and changed it to an okay. IV, but they but, did. But, but the thing is, all this innovation seems to be cut off. Innovative articles are relegated to tertiary journals. The professional organizations ridicule this with a venomous yeah. aggressiveness. And I wondered if you could comment on why are things like this being held back? What's wrong with the science community, which we count on for innovation? Well, whenever you are disrupting an established economic base, you're going to get some pretty brutal pushback. So remember the record companies suing the grandmothers and the, and the teenagers because they file shared and downloaded copyrighted music, then they literally sent them to jail? I mean, that's kind of aberrant behavior, but there's a lot of money on the table. So that's part of it, that there's a huge economic base that you're going up against. Um, but the other thing is, um, whenever there's a new digital disruption, the regulatory structure has been set up and refined for the previous technologically enabled world. And, um, and so many times those regulations, which are very slow to change, like at the FDA, uh, you, for instance, have seen the battle between the FDA and 23 recently. Um, it takes them forever to change the regulations. And so the innovators are always up against just all these forces. But they win. And we will win. This, this, this too shall pass. And those that are pioneers get the reward of arrows at the back. And we know that. That's why, you know, we're, I mean, when I started making my data available, it was a pretty dangerous thing to do. You know, I can have my insurance policies canceled. I can, you know, now fortunately, one by one, we're getting laws in to protect us. But uh, somebody's got to start it. And uh, don't expect it to be easy if you're going to be a pioneer. Let's try one more on this side, and then we'll go to the other side with three questions and see where we are. The freaks in Park City, I measure my sleep, I measure what I eat, and I measure my exercise. But how do you measure stress? Oh, well, use EM wave. PC, it's just look it up, EM, like electromagnetic wave PC, and um, it's called a heart rate uh, 
uh, great variability. So what it is is you just measure, put a little thing on your finger or your ear that measures your accurately measures your pulse, measures your pulse like this. And your heartbeat goes up one like this a little bit, one like this a little bit, and just measure the time between the two peaks, and then keep track of those numbers. So if your pulse is say 60, you have a beat per second, right? But it's not the distance between those peaks isn't one second, one second, one second. It's 0.98 seconds, 1.02 seconds, 0.95 seconds, and so there's a certain variability to your heart rate that directly reads out your stress level. And in fact, there's an app, there's a app uh, you can get from either the Apple Store or uh, the Google Play Store uh, called Stress Check, and you just put your, you know the camera, okay, you just put your finger over the, the camera and the flash, and they just leave the flash on, and your skin is transparent in the infrared. So it reads directly out and plots the graph of your heart rate. It uses the digital signal processing on your phone to calculate that set of numbers, and then turns that into uh, a measure of your instantaneous level of stress. And then what the EMYPC does is it uses biofeedback techniques to train you to recognize how to bring your, see, Every organ in your body has two nervous systems, the sympathetic and parasympathetic. And, and all of us A-type you know, achievers are just using the sympathetic. One tells your, your you know, vessels to contract, and the other says dilate. All we do is contract, right? That's why we, well, anyway, if you stay stressed all the time, guess what? You damage your body. So how do you, you can learn, though, what it feels like. This is what yoga is about. This is what meditation is about. You can feel what it means when you're allowing both sides to be in balance in your nervous system. This is not touchy-feely, it's just hard science. And I did it. I, I, I mean, I, I remember when the doctor had these electrodes on me, he said, anytime you want, you know, sit in the chair and relax. I said, okay, let's do it. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I said, well, whenever you're ready, I said, relax. Uh -huh. Well, you see that number up there? It's 27. And when it gets to 7, you're relaxed. And then she taught me some breathing exercises and everything. I kind of began to actually relax. And, you know, use the your breath as the tool you always have with you, right? Uh, and 7. And, then I, and I felt, I said, wow. I've never felt like that. <laughs> it's called being relaxed. <laughs> and then what you do is you learn how to do your work, but not having this artificial level of stress that you're just carrying around with you. It's like, you know, when you're tense, you can learn to actually relax your muscles, right? You still do work, but you do it in a relaxed state, and that greatly lengthens your life and makes you a lot healthier. Let's so try a couple on this side. Easily do it. So I have a two-part question. One is the technology part, and the other is your practice. Um, I really believe that food is individual. So I hate the one-size-fits-all solution of, oh, stop gluten or whatever. Right. So my question is, how do, how do you go about logging your food? And the other is, when is the technology going to catch up that I take a picture of my food and it logs instead of the you know, hassle of trying to type in every bean that I eat? It's difficult right now. I mean, I, I did uh, my fitness pal uh, for four months. It almost ended my marriage. Because <laughs> I said, so honey, here's how it's going to work. That's real cool. So if we, if we eat a processed food that's got a barcode, you just do the barcode, it goes off from the net to a, a data center somewhere, comes back with essentially the breakdown that you see on the food label, and adds it into the spreadsheet on your, on your computer. But we don't eat processed food. We cook everything from scratch with organic, locally grazed. So, okay, honey, we're going to have to figure out how many grams of each ingredient that we're using to create this, and then I and then I've got to look each one of those ingredients up, and then put in the number of grams, and then add that in. Okay, so it takes about twice as long to eat and cook as because. You're doing, but once you do this for a few weeks, you have a very good estimate. Of, of, of what the way you eat, what it's doing in terms of calories, uh, the balance between the proteins, carbs, fats, how much, are you getting enough fiber, are you getting too much salt, 
are you getting too much sugar? And you then go look back and you can see exactly which foods you were eating that led to the negative outcome you don't want. You change those out, you begin to look up foods that have less of that, and there's a giant universe of foods you've never eaten. Right? That's wonderful. So when people say, well, Larry, how do you give up this, this, and this? I said, because I was I stopped, because I took the blinders off, and then as a result of just eating the standard stuff, there was this wonderful array of things I never knew about that were so much better. So I think um, we, I want to say something. Mark Anderson actually has a lot to add to that. Um, so if you could just give him the microphone, you have something to talk about as far as taking a picture of the food. So it, part of this bromance, now you know why I'm so excited about this guy, is that Larry's on my advisory board for FIRE, and I'm on his advisory board for CalIT2 at Qualcomm Institute, and he's on my advisory board for what we call nutritional microanalysis, which we're just getting launched. But if you're here the first night, you heard about it. But the, the basic idea that a computer person would look at this whole healthcare thing and say, well, there are three boxes. There's an output, there's the stuff in the middle, which is your body, what it does, and there's the input. And for all of time, we've been filling out the output box and the middle box, and we have zero knowledge, basically, about the most important box, which is what you take in. So we're going to try to work on this a little bit together and figure out the answer to your question. And we, we actually put this up at fire, and we had our CTO challenge address this question, your exact question, last year. And we gave them three days to figure out what can technology do? How would you commercialize this stuff? What do you do first, second, and third? And it turns out that this thing with the camera is a really important part of it. So instead of doing what Larry did, which is very precise, having an iPhone app where you just shoot your breakfast, lunch, and dinner and get a relatively good read on what you're eating and not wreck your marriage at the same time. <laughs> um, and, and then, you know, do that pretty often. And, and I think the result of that is you get a pretty good a test of a biochemical level description of what you're eating, not just on the label where it goes how many carbs, but you actually would know biochemically what you're eating. And that's the level of detail we have to have to do this next this next test. Awesome. Right, yeah. I agree that there needs to be a lot of personal responsibility in, in what we do to our bodies. A lot of that is apparent. You know, you eat certain foods, you feel bad, or you get uh, bloating or whatever, you stay away from those. I think what's important is your four pillars that you talked about. What bothers me a little bit right now is the word you said, entrepreneurial. And right now we have people like you buy them, but for $89 you can get your microbiome, at least at one site, if you want five sites, it's over $1,000. You can get your uh, gene um, analyzed, your genes analyzed. The problem is, what need, what's neat is what you're talking about, we have an enormous data set, and then we know what it means. Right now, the entrepreneur, entrepreneurs are selling data, it's meaningless. And There's a lot to do with that. Yeah, no, I, it's, it's what's called, what they call early days. Um, you know, if you went back to the website when there were, there were only 100 websites, they were a pretty crazy bunch of websites. There was no commercial websites, and, and you know, there were early, remember pets.com? Remember you know, all these things that were complete bogus companies that got a lot of money and then went completely bankrupt? And that's what happens whenever you have one of these digital, trans, uh, digital transformations. You don't start out with the answer of the companies and the right solutions and everything. You get people trying stuff with what the tech is. The tech is better, better. And many of these the companies that are there today won't be here. In a few more years, but there's some data that it's meaningless. It's not meaningless. I mean, uh, if if you have the ability to interpret it, like 23andMe, I was able to find out that I actually had a single nucleotide polymorphism. That is one of the classic polymorphisms for uh, inflammatory bowel disease. So that was actually something you could figure out. Uh, I admit, though, that a lot of it's, it's too early for a lot of people. I would not advise most people to go get their human genome done right now. Because until you have a population-wide set of genomes that are then correlated with the phenotypes, that is the actual way your body works, most of that is meaningless. And, and, but that's what is going to happen uh, over the next few years. So, you know, if you want to wait a few years, it's not going to be many uh, until this is much richer 
and uh, its ability to give you feedback that's actionable uh, in your own life. So it would be willing to do one I think, to be fair, from each side, Maureen, you've got your hand up. Well, sure. Your thoughts on uh, blood type and nutrition and intake and how they're related? Right, so uh, there are roughly four blood types, and, and there are books, Eat for Your Blood Type. Uh, this was one of the oldest ways of, um, you know, your type O, your type A, whatever, uh, blood type. Uh, then, you know, you should eat meat, you shouldn't eat meat, you should be more vegetarian. These were the, sort of the earliest, it goes back, gosh, probably 100 years or something. Um, so it was one of the earliest ways of uh, breaking up people into sets, in that case, a pretty crude thing. Um, I don't know how much. There's so much variation genetically within people who are type, like I'm type O blood, um, that how useful it is, I don't know. But the kind of genetic cohorts that we will be finding out very soon now, uh, in which we have evolved people, you know, it, it's not down to the individual, but you know, like 100,000 people will have this basic genetic makeup. And there'll be a drug or a, or a therapy that is going to be effective, but it won't be over here. One way you're seeing this, by the way, is in is cancer. So the, the cancer and chemotherapy has been revolutionized in the last few years because a cell in your body that becomes a cancer cell is your cell, right? It didn't come from outer space. It's one of your cells, and it has the same DNA that the uncancerous cells have, except it's got a break or a mutation or an inversion or a deletion. Something about the software in that cell has become different. So what they do is they go in and they actually sequence the solid tumors and find out what kind of mistake has happened in your particular cancer. And then they know which chemotherapy chemotherapies are going to be effective, and which ones are just going to make you sick and not help you at all. And so almost all major cancer centers are moving very quickly into this, and it's one of the very first examples of actionable information that comes from looking not just at your human genome, but in variations within you, within some of your cells, which become cancerous, of your human genome, and then directly targeting that to a choice of chemotherapy. So that's a, a, just a, one of the very first examples. We're going to see so many more uh, so quickly over the next few years, I, I, I guess, and particularly when it includes the microbiome. In terms of genes, the individual unit along DNA that makes a protein, 99% of the genes in your body reside in the DNA of the microbes, not your human cells. And they make a third of the metabolites, the small molecules in your bloodstream. And none of that is in medicine today. It will be the medicine of 2020. On that note, Larry, thank you for